everybody. We're back. We're at the General Thomas Stafford Air Space Museum located outside of Weatherford, Oklahoma. We've been here before. This is really a cool museum. So, hey, it's Saturday. Come on along and join us. We're going to get started. Let's go. Okay, before we go in, we're going to take a look at some aircraft around here. This is a a fighter jet. This actually has Team Shepard on it. That would have been the general. Let's go down here and read this plaque here just real quick. Um, there we go. This is a Fairchild Republic A-10 Thunderbolt II is what this is. The A-10 is the only aircraft whose main airframe was totally designed around a gun. The 30mm General Electric GAU-8A Avenger Cannon is what makes the Warthog famous and extremely lethal. The cannon fires rounds the size of beer bottles from its seven rotating barrels. Each round has a core made from a depleted uranium. And there's the round. And then there is what fires it right there. That's it right there. Guarantee you wouldn't want that those size of those rounds coming at you, I can guarantee you that. It's really windy out today, but we're going to be going inside here in just a minute. U.S. Air Force, big fighter jet. Look at that thing. That is huge. And then over here we have a space capsule. We're going to go look at it. General Tom Stafford was a pilot and, of course, he was also an astronaut. And he hails from Weatherford, Oklahoma. That's why they have the museum here in his honor. This is the front of the museum. We're going to go in here in just a minute and get out of this wind. This is the General Thomas P. Stafford Air and Space Museum. And that's what this is dedicated after, is the General Stafford. All right, well, let's get on in here and we'll get started. Oh, here you go. Here's a monument. Lieutenant General Thomas P. Stafford, astronaut, test pilot, author, and fighter pilot. Lieutenant General. Wow, cool. Okay, we're going to go ahead and go on in. Okay, we got our mission paid, and now we're getting ready to enter the actual museum. This looks like a missile here. B-61 thermal nuclear bomb is what this is. Wow. Oh, wow. Is one. They're larger than they look. Now here is another. This is actually a MK-1 bomb, nicknamed the little boy. 
the MK-1 bomb, nicknamed Little Boy, was the first nuclear weapon used in warfare. It was delivered by the B-29 Enola Gay on display at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum and detonated at an altitude of 1,800 feet over Hiroshima, Japan on August 6th of 1945. Now up here it says Spirit of America. At 8:15, a weather from Hiroshima that conditions are good. They actually have a simulator. Hop on in it says. Look at that simulator. Look at that. Wow. Well, look at all those gauges. Look at all those gauges and instruments and switches. Boy, oh, howdy. Let me get up here. Boy, oh, howdy. That's a... That is crazy. Look at that. I'm not going to get in it because I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to get out. <laughs> now here's a little... This is called... A, I can't pronounce it here. T-A-C-I-T Rainbow. That's what this device is. Now here you go. Now I've heard of these. This here is a AIM-9 Sidewinder missile. Tell you what, you wouldn't want to <laughs> look at your mirror and see this thing headed towards you. You would not be having a good day. The A. AIM-9 Sidewinder is a supersonic heat-seeking air-to-air missile carried by fighter aircraft. In September 1958, Chinese nationalist F-86 fired the first Sidewinder air-to-air missiles down 11 communist Chinese MiG-17s over the Formosa Straits. Until then, the aircraft defensive means were primarily limited to pilots and tail gunners firing small caliber ammunition in dogfight situations. And then here's another one. This is the MK-84 bomb. The Mark... 84 is the largest of the Mark 80 weapons introduced during the Vietnam War. It was nicknamed the Hammer. I think you can actually see why. The Mark 84 is capable of forming a crater of 50 feet wide and 36 feet deep. It can penetrate up to 15 inches of metal or 11 feet of concrete, depending on the height from which it is dropped and causes lethal fragmentation to a radius of 400 yards. It has a weight of 2,000 pounds. The hammer is delivered by various aircraft, including the F-16. I mean, the aircraft are really large. You just really... Can't tell it. There's a gentleman there, a pallet getting ready to take off. This says, in memory of Alexei Linoff, May 30th, 1934 to October 11, 2019. 
exhibition took place at Stafford Air Museum in June of 2015. Many dignitaries from across the world attended the special anniversary event, including General Stafford's dear friend and Soyuz commander, Alexei Linov. Flew this, uh, General Stafford flew this MiG over Area 51 during his time at the base. And then here's the pictures, left to right. Michael, Stafford's adopted son from Russia, General Stafford, Stas, Stafford's adopted son from Russia. Hmm. I'm going to walk up here very carefully and we'll get a let's get up here so we can see just how huge this aircraft is. Can you imagine sitting in the cockpit here? I know it's dark. You really can't see anything. That's the cockpit. And there again, all kinds of dials and switches and gauges and knobs and you're looking out over this way but then behind you is the rest of the aircraft wow there's one of the wings Wow, this kind of look. This this is one of the ones we've already looked at. And there's one over here. We're going to take a look at here in just a minute. So let's go back down here, and we'll take a look at this one. This is actually a T-38 Talon. Tom Stafford was the T-38A project test pilot and manager for the U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School at Edwards Air Force Base. The T-38 became the United States Air Force first supersonic trainer. The T-38 prototype first flew on April 10th, 1959. The production continued until 1972. A total of 1,189 T-38s were built. Some were later modified into AT-38Bs with external armament for weapon training purposes. NASA used them to maintain astronauts' proficiency in high-performance aircraft and as observer at Chase Plains for the space shuttle. Wow. The video really does these no justice. These are huge aircraft. And there's a missile right there. These missiles have got to be, oh gosh, 10 feet long. Just kind of looking around here um, at all these aircraft. Hmm. This would have been the ejector seat, if I'm not mistaken. What they would eject out of if they had to. And here's the nose of a, another. Korean War. F-86 versus the MiG-15. This is one of the engines. 
General Electric 1A turbojet engine. The A1, I, I1, I guess, I1, was the first turbojet engine manufactured in the United States, was a copy of the highly secret British White or Whittle engine, and was developed and built from an engine and plans which had been provided by the British government in October of 1941. There are talks about airflow, air warms to compression heating thrust, and okay. Let's go to the inside of one of these. Oh, there's the Hindenburg airship up there. And there's a, another aircraft. The Bell aircraft called the Glamorous Glennis. Bright orange. Wow. Now we're getting ready to enter. I think we're getting ready to go into the next area, I think. Now this talks about the Hindenburg, and that's what we're looking at up here. This is the Hindenburg. How big was the Hindenburg? It was 804 feet. Boeing 747 is 200 feet. The Special is 122 feet. The Titanic was 882 feet. And the Empire State Building was 1,472 feet. So it kind of gives you a comparison. Was the Hindenburg a blimp? A blimp or a pressure airship is powered, steerable, light, lighter than air vehicle, whose shape is maintained by the pressure of the gases within its envelope. In other words, if the blimp deflates, it loses its shape. Here's an illustration of the Hindenburg above New York City, 1937. The largest aircraft ever built, Hindenburg. The LZ-129 Hindenburg was a German Zeppelin. During its second year service, it was destroyed by fire while landing at the Lakehurst Naval Air Station, New Jersey, on May 6, 1937, 13 passengers and 22 crew members died in the accident. And there's a picture of it ex when it exploded. I think we're going to go on this way first, then we'll go on. No, I think that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah, okay. Kind of get our bearings straight here, which way we're supposed to be going. Okay, this is the Atlas rocket engine. The Atlas rocket engine, the Atlas rocket was developed by the U.S. Air Force to be the nation's first intercontinental ballistic missile. Hmm. Capable of boosting a nuclear warhead to any target on Earth, the program began in the early 1950s with the first served as one of the primary ballistic missiles until it was phased out of Strategic Missile Service in 1955. 
At that time, the missiles become available for use as boosters after refurbishment. Okay, let's go check out. A lot of different kind of rockets. Hmm. R1, R7, Vostok. God, I don't know, I can't pronounce some of these. N1, Shuttle Bren Energia, and of course here's our space shuttle, Apollo Saturn, Apollo Saturn 1B, the Gemini Titan 2, Mercury Atlas, Mercury Rhine, uh, Redstone, Jupiter C, Vanguard, American V2, and the Goddard rocket. Wow. Now let's go check this out over here. Wow, look at the inside of that. That's huge. Look at that. Hmm. Wow, this is just incredible. <clears throat> this says over the next generation launch vehicles. This is the uh, LR87, the engine that launched the Titan II. Huh. Wow. Wow, that's crazy. That's just one engine. That's crazy. Tom Stafford, Gemini. You signed it. That's cool. And over here. We have the J-2 rocket engine. These things are absolutely huge. Hmm. Wow. The J-2 rocket engine. That's what we're looking at right here. America's largest production of liquid hydrogen fueled rocket engine before the space shuttle main engines and is being revived in support of NASA's return to the moon. And here is a Soviet NK-33 rocket engine, is what this is.
Hmm. <clears throat> well, let's walk on around here. Wow, well, yeah, I tell you what. These are just absolutely huge. We were informed that the last since we've been here, they've actually expanded the museum. These are some survival uh, machete, machete, machete pocket knives right there, and then uh, on loan from the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. Water treatment kit, radio transmitter, thermal blankets. Okay. This is the new exhibit that they've just talked about. This is actually space shuttle fixed base simulator. So this is what it would have or what it would look like inside. See, there's where the astronauts would sit. And just look at that instrument panel or panels. That's crazy. And then here's where the other pilots would sit. And I know. Look at that. It's just, that's just crazy. I wouldn't know what to. Do first. <laughs> I guess that's why they got all that training. This is the like, like I said, this shuttle fixed base simulator. Hmm. This is the actual space shuttle fixed base simulator that was located at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston for more than 30 years. All 135 shuttle crews did their primary fixed base training in the simulator and the DNA of every shuttle astronaut in this unit. And it shows some pictures if I can get without the glare. Hmm. This was part of the, this is a model of the crawler. This is what the space shuttle would have set on. One mile per hour. And that's part of it right there. The crawlers cost $14 million each in 1967. And here's the picture of it being as it's going down to the launching pad. That is crazy. This is the, some of the items. Sanitation waste storage bag. Apollo. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, all kinds of... Here's the food they would have ate. Cereal bar. Fruit cake. Bacon bars. Water dispensers. There's the boots they would have worn. Hmm. 
some of their equipment, altitude, altitude indicator. Various kind of cameras. Oh. Okay, here's a here's a model of the International Space Station, ISS. Well, there is just a lot to see in this museum. I mean, a lot to see. Apollo Docking Probe Assembly. Okay. This is Colonel Alexei A. Lenoff. Dressed in actual Soyuz flown cosmonauts in flight garment worn during the ASTP mission. Okay. Here's Brigadier General Thomas P. Stafford. This is the Apollo Soyuz test project, the world's first international manned space flight, was commanded by Weatherford native General Thomas P. Stafford. Hmm, okay. Oh, here you go. Here's some nice pictures and Russian leader watch there. Apollo cap there with signatures and all that on it. Hand painted lacquer box depicting the missions of the Apollo program. And here are some glasses from uh, 1961. Here's some medals. I mean, there's just all kinds of plates. It looks like a razor. Oh, look at that camera set up. A Soviet Zenit 35 millimeter camera used by the cosmonauts during the Apollo Soyuz mission. Hmm. Wow. Russian TOZ-82, three-barreled three-barreled firearm designed at the nearly 300-year-old Tula Arms Factory by Soviet engineer Vladimir Alexandrovich. Each of the three barrels are a single shot, 11-inch long break open tubes that are reloaded by cracking the weapon open, inserting live rounds and removing shell casings by hand. Wow. One powerful weapon. That must be General Stafford, and I'm not sure who the other individual is. Well, I think we're done in here. Let's go over to the next area. 
Here's hatch and valve functions for the test project. Docking module or simulator panel. Okay, we've gotten another section here. Here's an old biplane. I love these. I've seen these in air shows over the years. This is actually the sup with pup. Oh, it says look up. Okay. World War One fighters. Now they also had the sup with camel. And this is the sop with pup. The sop sop with pup ranks as one of the truly great combat aircraft of World War One. Some have called it the most perfect flying machine ever made. Regardless, the pup was undeniably a docile of competing one on one with any combat aircraft in the sky at the time of its debut during the spring of 1916. Hmm. It proved so effective against German aircraft that German pilots consciously avoided confrontation with it until the advent of more capable German pursuits. By the end of 1917, The pup's advantage had been offset by newer designs. It was quickly phased out as more advanced aircraft became available. Now let's go over here to see the pilot there and the uh, big gun up there. Probably 50 cal, 50 caliber, I would imagine. Yep, I've seen these in air shows. They're pretty cool. Now. This would have to be um, this is 1911 Curtis Pusher Model D. And look to the engine back there. It's got a big wingspan. The uh, pusher biplane design developed by Glenn H. Curt Curtis between 1809 and 1912 is among the most successful important aircraft of pioneer era. Not only did it produce these airplanes in large numbers, but numerous copies and variations were built by others. Pretty lengthy article, but that's basically the nutshell. That's what that is. And there again, it's bigger than it looks. Oh, and here's the Spirit of St. Louis. Charles Augustus Lindbergh, first nonstop solo transatlantic flight. Well, let me get some more video. That's supposed to be Charles Lindbergh right there. Oh, it's actually got a, the doors open. Let's go. Let's walk up here and take a look inside this aircraft. There's the instrument gauge, gauges rather, and, and it's got a bamboo chair. How unique is that? 
very simple. It looks like horse. I couldn't fly one, but it looks simple compared to some of those other aircraft we've been looking at. The Ryan NYP Spirit of St. Louis. The Spirit of St. Louis was named in honor of Lindbergh supporters in St. Louis, Missouri, who paid for the aircraft. NYP is an acronym for New York Paris, the object of the flight. Because the fuel tanks were located ahead of the cockpit for safety in case of an accident, Lindbergh could not see directly ahead except by using a periscope on the left side. Oh, that's interesting. On May 21, 1927, Charles A. Lindbergh completed the first solo and nonstop transatlantic flight in history. Lindbergh, with his plane, Ryan NYP Spirit of St. Louis flew 5,810 kilometers in 33 hours, 30 minutes between Roosevelt Field and Long Island, New York, and Le Bourge Field in Paris, France, winning the $25,000 prize offered by the New York hotel owner Raymond Ortigue. The aftermath of the flight was the Lindbergh boom in aviation aircraft industry. Stocks rose in value and interest in flying skyrocketed after that. This is a Continental W670 Reaper uh, Re <laughs> I'm tongue-tied right now. Engine. Um, okay. Well, there's another engine back in there. And that's the Spirit of St. Louis. And then kind of just turn around here a little bit. Oh, here's another aircraft. This is a 1909 I cannot pronounce these. It's French. The Louis Blairway, I don't know, crosses the English Channel. 1942, the U.S. Army Air Force started using the Bobcat, nicknamed the Bamboo Bomber, as a light personal, personal transport. It used two 245 horsepower Jacob R755-9 radical piston engines. Okay, well that's interesting. This is the, I believe this is one of the Wright brothers. See how it had to lay down in the, in the plane? It's interesting. Oh, here's one way up here. I'll try to get this here. These are just, they'll kind of go over here a little bit and kind of swing around. It almost looks like a big kite, doesn't it? Wow. Okay, evidently this exhibit is under construction. Here's a right wind tunnel.
Okay. Development of the Wright Flyers. 1903 Wright Flyer, first flight. On December 17th, 1903, Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, the 1903 Wright Flyer became the first powered heavier-than-air machine to achieve controlled, sustained flight with a pilot aboard. With Orville Wright as a pilot, the airplane took off from a launching rail and flew for 12 seconds, a distance of 37 meters or 120 feet. The airplane was flown three more times that day with Orville and his brother Wilbur alternating as pilot. The longest flight with Wilbur at the controls was 260 meters or 852 feet and lasted 59 seconds. And then it just tells about right two and right three. There's an old safe. That's interesting. The Reliable Safe and Lock Company, Covington, Kentucky. Hmm. It's interesting how they had to lay down <clears throat> to maneuver the aircraft. They used giant spruce wood as their construction material. Well, that's interesting. Now it's got this little section up here, and that was actually part of the plane, but I'm not sure unless it was to control the wings, those wings. But there's either, either <laughs> Wilbur or Orville laying there. Chain driven mechanisms back there. Okay. The Ride Cycle Shop. This all started uh, from a bicycle shop, I do believe. In the late 1885, 1895, rather, the Wrights began to make preparations to manufacture their own bicycles. And that's where they eventually came up with the developing the airplane. But there's one of their bicycles there. And their little shop where they built the bicycles. And eventually aircraft. Well, that's interesting. Okay. And we trusted Tom. And I think that therefore he was just an empty. This is the Gemini. Now, can you speak Russian very well? The Russians used to say that uh, Tom spoke Russian with that Oklahoma accent. And they call it Oklahoma. We asked the Russians, you know, we'd like to go to their launch site, climb up on the gantry, look into the soybean. They said, no way, that's secret. Tom was cool. He said, look. You can tell the world we have arrived, Thomas Stafford. That's interesting. There's somebody floating in. Space or just uh, learning how to float around, I guess. This is the military uniform of Soviet cosmonaut Major General Alexei Linov. General Linov is one of Russia's, Russia's most beloved space heroes. And that's boiled all those ribbons and medals. Wow. Crazy. Wow. 
This is uh, General Stafford in his younger days. Following the flight of Apollo 10 with three space flights behind him, Tom Stafford was one of the most experienced space explorers in the world. Back to the Air Force and a second star, 1975-1978. This is a flight suit that General Stafford wore as Commander General of Air Force's Flight Test Center at Ed Edwards Air Force Base. That's the B-2 Stealth. Now, I actually seen one of those at an air show in Wichita, Kansas one year. It was very heavily guarded. They had an armed soldier at each corner with a rope around the aircraft. That one right there. True story. Just some of the planes he flew and <clears throat> piloted. The Academy years. This is the lobby area of the actual airport. And we might go out there for just a minute. We got the model planes up above. It says, Welcome to Weatherford, Oklahoma, Route 66. Quite an individual, really had a lot of accomplishments. Test pilot, astronaut, really cool. I just showed that of an eagle getting ready to land. This is final approach. Gear down, flaps down, clear to land. <laughs> That's cool. This is the actual airport. I know. This is the actual airport part. They got a little place where you can sit. Even got a barbecue grill out here. Pretty cool. They got a car out here that's got Weatherford on it and the Ford, looks like. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Don't look like anything's getting ready to land anytime soon, so I think we'll go on. Well, we was on our way out, we saw this happy birthday to General Stafford. It's been signed by a lot of people. 90 orbits around the sun, 52 trillion, 560 billion miles. Let's just get a close-up here. This is him as a baby. And then on. And then there he is at 90. It's pretty cool. Okay, 
I sure thank you for joining us today at the General Stafford Airspace Museum here in Weatherford, Oklahoma. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your support. I'm glad you enjoy my videos. If you're not a subscriber and you enjoy my videos, I just ask that you like, subscribe, and share. These are strictly for just enjoyment and entertainment. And like I always say, I will see you on the next video. This vlog is over. Well,